Everyone, welcome back to the highlights from the Innovators Mindset podcast for the 2023 year. And what an honor to have you here, to spend time with you, to share these incredible guests and some of their takeaways from their learning, from their work. And the theme of today's podcast is the idea of being observant, which is one of the characteristics of the Innovators Mindset. It actually seems to be one that people really don't pay attention to, which is kind of ironic because the notion of being observant is so imperative in our world. And when you think of this term observant, I'll give you an example of this. When I first really started focusing on the idea of innovation and why it was so crucial to what we do in education, the reality of this is I found innovation in everything that I was looking at, whether it was a TV show, whether it was a song, whether it's something we're doing in education, outside of education. When you focus on something and you're really passionate about it, that something tends to find you. That's why this is so imperative is because you start creating these connections. And one of the things that I really love is how do you take something that totally doesn't make any sense to what we do in education and then seeing the value of it, connecting it to the world of education and and why it you know, becomes so popular. This is getting harder and harder to do because we are so inundated with information. So much is being thrown at us that it's hard to pay attention. It's hard to have that observation. We, things get uh, tend to get lost in the noise. And when I wrote about this idea of being observant in the innovator's mindset, I wrote this simply just to kind of give you a definition. Uh, great ideas often spark other great ideas. The notion of genius hour, which is an idea that has spread throughout schools all over the world, came about because educators noticed what was going on outside of schools and modified those ideas to meet their students' needs. The power of the internet is that we have access to so much information from schools and other organizations, Although an idea observed in the business world might not necessarily work as is for a school, if we learn to connect ideas and reshape them, it can become something pretty amazing. Part of the issue with the idea of being observant is not only all the information that's being thrown at us, but all of the initiatives, just constant changing, uh, new things coming up. And so it's harder to kind of keep up. And so I actually wrote this post and I'll share it down in the links down below on just kind of four ideas how to become observant in a world full of noise. And the first one is listening more. This seems like kind of obvious when you think of the term observant, you think listening is, you know, kind of obviously connected to this. The problem with this is we live in a society right now where people are more focused on being first than sharing the correct information that something happens and we all got to put our two cents into it right away. And as the years have progressed, I'm very aware of what's going on in education through social media, but I tend to just listen more. And I used to make fun of lurkers and stuff like that. And maybe I'm a little bit more of a lurker than I used to be. And I try to take those ideas, try to, you know, dig into them deeper, share them through my blog, but I never feel that I have to be first on something because being first and wrong is not something I want to be. And you can see this with news organizations, social media, people jumping to conclusions really quick. So just kind of sitting back and listening, it seems to be really, really hard. Uh, I know we always talk about, we need to get our voice out into the world, but it's, it's kind of useless if everyone's talking and no one's listening. So that was the first one that I listed. Uh, the second one is connected, obviously, is slowing down. The process of just kind of taking information, absorbing, reflecting, and I talked about reflection in one of the podcasts. I think that's a, a really important, important thing. Uh, this, this recent move to Orlando, and I don't know if it's still recent, it's been over a year and a half now, I think somewhere along that lines, the, the thing that I'm really trying to get better at is to just read, take in information, stay off my phone. That has really, really helped me kind of just take in information and it has helped with anxiety, uh, but it's also helped with my thinking where I connect these ideas kind of step back. 
Um, that has always been something that's been a struggle for me. And the more I, the better I, the more I get better at it, the more it seems to be helpful. Uh, the third one is just taking the time to write and process my reflections. Like I said earlier, when, when we listen, um, we tend to make these connections. The thing that I do with my speaking that is really, really important to me. And I, I've shared this with people over and over again is I don't actually, um, speak about things until I write about them. And the reason that I write about them or before I speak about them is because writing and knowing that everyone can see my writing. In fact, sharing this blog post is one of those ways you can see my writing. It actually makes me think of the viewpoints of others that if I'm going to put something out there that I know anyone can read, I'm trying to think what are the, what are, what's going to be the pushback? What's going to be the challenge to this? So when you actually go through that process of kind of just thinking about, um, you know, what will other people think about this? It makes you take what I call a 360 degree view. What are the challenges? Can we address them before they're in the comments or the pushback? So that's really helped me just kind of slow down, listen more and just reflect. And I think these are all connected. And you see like um, people, you know, think when I share the characteristics of the innovators mindset, and those are shared in the blog post. Um, in the link down below, that each one works in isolation, but they're connected, you know, being observant and reflection are very deeply connected. And so the last one that I share in this blog post is how do we cut out as much unnecessary negativity in our lives? When we talk about the voice in our head, that holds us back, that kind of slows us down. Oftentimes, it's not the voice in our head it's the voice we think others say about us and even sometimes the people who love you the most are the ones that sometimes hold you back and not because they want to hold you back but because they're terrified of seeing people fail and so I'm very cognizant of who I surround myself with um, what I listen to and what I don't and really kind of separating some of this stuff because when I connect with people I'm very cognizant how do I feel after my time with them do I feel better or do I feel deflated and the more you feel deflated the harder it is to concentrate the harder well at least for me anyway the harder it is for me to um, really kind of step back and and really think about thought my own thoughts I tend to think about what I did wrong what's wrong with me and there is a really good place in our in our lives where we have to surround ourselves with people that will challenge us to push us to become better. But also we have to understand that some people are pushing you because of maybe their own insecurities, maybe, um, and they're not pushing you to be better, they're pushing you to push you down. And so when we do that, we start to maybe be fearful of our dreams, to kind of step back, to not necessarily embrace them and focus more on what's wrong with us rather than what could be right. And, and if you really want to do great work, constantly focusing on the negative is only going to hold you back and won't help to see those opportunities. The, the more you put yourself out in the world and the more you're willing to share your ideas, what I've found is that the more it comes back to you, and I know that's maybe kind of like the secret, things like that, whatever. You can call it whatever you want, but it is a reality. And I think it's not because those things find you, but you're more open to those things being found. And that's really kind of the crux of being observant. And so I wanted to share that with you. I hope you got something out of this, but if you didn't, I guarantee you'll get something out of my wonderful guests from this past year. Welcome back to one of the highlight videos from 2023 on the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I talk about this all the time is that people will say, oh, tech, you know, innovation, technology, they're, you know, like they're separate, you know, they're not really, they're, and I'm like, not, you didn't really do that because typically the people that are the innovation people in districts are the tech people that we just changed your title, right? Like, right. We from like director of technology to director of innovation. And my argument's always been is like, why isn't your curriculum person 
the yeah. innovation person, right? Because we're it's really about how we look at new and better ways of learning. So how did you see like your role as, you know, as an English teacher really kind of, you know, moving towards that, that role of director of innovation? Well, I'm not saying this just because I'm on your show, but I think your book innovators mindset, I think that's, that's really the right approach. It's a, it is a mindset. No, I really mean that. So like, you know, I love literature. I love writing, but no matter where I was, like you could put me anywhere in the world. Like if I was at a hospital, I was looking around the hospital for ideas on what I could bring back to our school or our, our classroom. Right. I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, this, this uh, doctors walk around with an iPad, you know, doing clinical notes and stuff. We should have that in our schools for our, you know, for our special ed education department or guidance counselors. Um, you know, I went, I remember one time I went to a car dealership and the car dealership guy had a name tag on, on the back of the name tag. It kind of spelled out their mission and their culture statements right. and stuff. I'm like, I'm bringing that back to the school. And so I think when I was tapped out by another district to become the director of innovation, they'd already seen the ideas that I was collecting. And so you, you kind of, before you're a leader, you lead, right? That you, right. That's why you, that's why you get selected to lead. And I think, you know, I was thinking drones, you know, in the English classroom and right. my principal was like, you're crazy. You know, that's not where drones go, but uh, it really is your mindset. And, and I wanted to engage kids. I knew what they were interested in. I was, interested in it as well but um you know technology shouldn't be technology should be woven and embedded in everything mm -hmm. and a lot of a lot of innovation just isn't technology it's systems it's mm -hmm. it's a way of thinking it's it's um who do we need you know what positions we need to create and things so it's a mindset yeah uh, i'll give you an example of an innovation and you kind of alluded to it and it's something that um, was advice that was given to me to think differently um, when people are moving into administrator positions or want to, they're applying for assistant principal directors, things like this. And you mentioned that, you know, they already saw you leading. Uh, I tell people that are applying for those positions, find the leadership standards, wherever, whatever they use, and then actually show how you're meeting those leadership standards in your role as a teacher right now. So a classroom gets this teacher gets this, a parent gets this and does it with a kid. What do you like? What, what's the ultimate outcome? Like what's the, the oh, yeah. best possible outcome of this or what, what it will do for somebody. So, so my hopes, the three things that I want to have happen because people do this journal is I want them to get that flood of happiness chemicals mm -hmm. as they're doing it. I want this to improve their well being. I also want it to help take their relationships to the next level. I want this to improve their those interpersonal relationships between, you know, student to teacher, student to student, teacher to teacher. Like I want it to help with all of those. And then the and and I'm actually telling you the sections of the journal mm. because there's a section on, you know, gratitude for happiness, and then there's a section on gratitude with my peeps. Again, that's taking those relationships to the next level. And then the last section I'm so proud of all of the sections. And this one makes me really smile, make the world a legit better place. So right. gratitude with the world. And this is where, again, we're really encouraging people not only to bring things into the journal to, you could call it scrapbooking, you could call it memory book, whatever you want to do, um, but also to take things out of the journal. So we have cutouts in the journal. And one of my favorite things is we have these designed little like, yay, wow, you're awesome kind of cards that we want people to decorate if they want. They don't have to. They could just cut them out. And so they look like this. Sorry, you're going to see my little notes because this mm. is still a draft. Right. They cut them out. They keep them with them. And then when someone does something amazing for them, say thank you. If they're in the grocery store and someone helps them, give it to them. You and I travel a lot. And I have a lot of empathy for the food service workers at an airport. They're usually catching people not at their best because no. it's very stressful to travel. So I keep right. these with me and I can't tell you how people's face lights up. I mean, I'm thinking specifically of someone in a food service area when I was at an airport and, and I was just like, hey, you just have been like so kind mm -hmm. to me and your smile is so great. I just want to give you this. And their whole face just lit up. And I, I have a feeling maybe they don't get that kind of interaction a lot. So, so that's wow. the, that's the hope. I want it to make people happier. I want it to improve relationships and help make the world a legit better place. It's, it's like the Swiss army knife of gratitude. I feel 
It's got oh, it's got like everything. And it's not about anyone in particular, but sometimes I feel in the superintendency position, we can lose focus on the teaching and learning. And so we're, right. we're, we're saying stuff, but it doesn't, we don't really understand what goes on in the classrooms every single day. So how have you like found that balance? Because I, 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 I noticed you did that very, very well to really kind of understand and empathize and be able to work with your teachers. And when I say empathize, it doesn't actually mean that, you know, every facet of their job in the moment to the day, but you still put them in a position where they can be successful. So how, how do you find that balance? Yeah. So, um, and, and even beyond teachers and teaching and learning, I, I still think it, the number one priority is the student. So no matter what role I'm in, I don't want to be disconnected from kids. Right. So every, every week I make it a priority to get in classrooms. So, so far this year, I'm at 182 classroom visits. I've got a, a a chart on my board here in my office. And I, I make little notations, what, what buildings, what classrooms I go into. And my goal this year is 800 classroom visits. I want to get into classrooms because I don't feel like I can make any decision that's good for kids. If I don't know how kids are learning in the classrooms. So I, I go in it's, and I stay in my lane. I don't do walkthroughs. I, that's, that's not my lane. I just want to walk in and see what's happening. You know, I'm not a curriculum director anymore. I'm not a principal that that's not what I'm in the room. I'm just in the room to get the vibe to see if the level of rigor is where I truly believe it needs to be for all kids. And then, and then I, and also that opens the door for me to have conversations with teachers, not about teaching at all. It's how you doing today? Um, I, oh my gosh, I just, I love what I just saw. Um, you know, it is nothing that I'm going to, you know, write up an evaluation. It's just not what I do. But then at the end of the week, I put out what's called a superintendent shout out. And I share every good teaching and learning opportunity that I saw for the week. Mm -hmm. And that way someone at our high school can see what's going on. They've got a lens to what's happening in kindergarten. So there's no more of that well, they never learned that there, or they, you know, yes, right. kids are learning all across the district and I'm going to stay connected with that. That's my, I just have made that my priority. And then I, I also don't ignore what's happening politically as a superintendent. I can't. So if reading is, is what's on the mind of every Kansas legislature, then I need to make sure as, as a superintendent that my curriculum folks have what they need to ensure that we're on track with what the state wants for right. those initiatives. So um, it, it is, it's truly finding a balance, but also prioritizing. I mean, I just, I set myself up for, I try to do an hour a day in a building. That's my goal. You know, so like we were talking about running before and how you and I both track like what we're going to do every day. I'm like, Oh, you got that from running. You're like, uh, for sure. Totally. Yeah. Totally. That's cause that's like how I train. Like I just, I make yes. sure I write everything down. And so I just, that's, that's the first time I'm like, Oh, she got that from running. So <laughs> oh, for that's, sure. just, that's awesome. The, uh, um, the, one of the things I've been saying forever is, and I, so this is what I appreciate about you. Cause I knew, I didn't, I didn't know your answer, but I knew it. Do you know what I mean? I knew yeah. that's what you'd say is that don't make decisions for classroom. If you make decisions for classrooms, you have to be in the classrooms. Right. And that is something really, really important to me. And one of the conversations I've had with people over the years, they'll, you know, you'll see someone who has really great leadership skills and would be in a fantastic administrator, whether it's a principal, superintendent, whatever. And I'll say like, Hey, have you thought about this direction? And one of the things they say and I hear it all the time is why well, I, I like, I don't want to do that stuff. Like I really like being around kids. I'm like, you can be around kids. Like that's yeah. where are you getting the idea that you can't be around kids? Because right. a lot of times they see kind of what I was talking about. It's all about the politics. It's not about actually being in the classrooms. And there's a joke I make, and I'm sure you'll, you'll understand it, but it doesn't seem like you do it about the superintendent entourage where we bring in the board members and we all like crouch down and all that stuff. <laughs> and people, you know, it's, it feels very fake and people act a certain way because they think like I'm, I'm on watch, you know, for these few minutes that everyone's pretending that they really know what's going on in the classrooms. And I can really tell a lot about a, a superintendent, a principal is when they walk into the classroom, does anything, do people change their attitude? Right. And if you're, and if you're in it all the time, I guarantee you when you start, like when you started doing that. People are probably like terrified, yes. right? But yes. then now it's just like, oh yeah, 
Renee's. Yeah, it's second nature. It's it's not a big deal at all. One of my mentors, one of the things she said to me, and I've never been superintendent, but she said this to me as a principal, and I'm sure there's a um, there's a correlation to this role. Is she said when you leave that place, um, I want to know what your fingerprints were on that. That I should see, not necessarily like you know. I think a lot of times, uh, I've shared this story before. There was pictures of the principal in the school I was at, like basically who who is the principal in the school, and they would have those pictures up, and that was kind of like that. Your legacy was in that portrait, right? It was kind of like that. And I went to that school. I'm like, I don't want my print. I don't want my picture up there. Like that's to me is not important. And I actually um, encourage my staff. Let's get rid of those pictures and let's replace them with kids. And so in that school today, there's pictures of students in the front foyer instead of the principals. And even though there's no picture of me, I'm proud that some of my fingerprints are, I would rather have the pictures of kids up there still instead of a picture of myself. Yes. You know what I mean? And so that's part of the fingerprints. And so, you know, I, I and I'm sure that's the same thing too, right? You have a legacy in following Dr. Griffin into this role but you also got to put your own fingerprints. So like, what, what would you say maybe is like, what's something maybe you did that brought your own kind of style or presence to, to that new, that new role? Well, there again, we have to think about COVID and different things like right, you said, right. and the role that's coming in, you know, like yeah, remote learning and doing all that and just making sure that, you know, that students were fed, that teachers had access and they were able, kids were able to get online and do it. And then, you know, and just different, the support and just making sure that people, people saw the school as a community resource that we will help you. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then all of a sudden we almost, it's almost like starting over again. Now we're back to in-person learning and doing different things. So we've had, we've gone through COVID. So how does Chip Jones, like you said, and I agree, I don't need my picture at all. Right. I mean, take it down and whatever. And there are no pictures around here of people, administrators. By I'll, the be, way. I'll be yeah. there. Check it out. Right. Yeah, you can check it out. If you <laughs> we might put up a big one. I don't know. Maybe we'll put yours up. I don't know. <laughs> and um, we'll have a big one of you. And um, so, but I, I hope that my mark is, or that people know that we help kids especially all kids, but especially to at the high school level, get a more understanding of what they want to do when they leave here, that they've had experiences and that they know that they have had opportunities for job shadowing, for career development, right. and just being out and meeting people. And then one of the things that I like that I just, that I'm a firm believer in is, you know, I don't know if you've heard of Stephanie Krause, but, um, She's, she's an author, so she did some work here. And she talked about currencies one time. And one of those, if you know someone, then I, it's your obligation to help connect someone that may need that. Does that make sense? Yep. And so I like to do that. I feel that I want to be a connector to help, you know, if this kid needs this, then we've connected them to this opportunity, that I've been a connector to help them get an experience, mm -hmm. to help them grow. And to give, do you mind if I give you an example? Go for it. I'd love to hear So, it. like, you know, we were partnering with a local community college. So one time, you know, we had a in when in-person meetings were um getting back into place. And it's weird to say that. Mm -hmm. I took this opportunity because I had a Zoom and it wasn't enough time to drive back. So I was like, hey, do you have an empty classroom? I could do this Zoom, but they were gonna have this luncheon meeting. And they said, Hey, Chip, join us. Okay. So down in one of the counties microsoft has put in all these data centers and they had worked with the community local community college to have these mock data centers to help kids um get certification so eventually they could work with microsoft so i was sitting there cumberland is an hour and a half from this place so i asked the president and there a couple of deans i said well and these are chip terms i said how does cumberland get a piece of this pie right. you know we're an hour and a half away my kids deserve it as much as these others mm -hmm. i don't have a data center you know, and they said, well, I said, well, let's think about this. Let's let's get the right people. Let's let's design this plane. What are we going to do? So on that to, you know, to get to the point last year, we had four students and that's take the class virtually 
Monday through Thursday. Mm -hmm. Fridays, we transported them an hour and a half to this mock data center and for their hands-on portion of the class. And they walked away with some ITF and A-plus certifications at the end of the year. And these kids are now going to the VCU and the George Masons pursuing mm -hmm. computer science. I love does that, that make sense? It and does. it's just the connecting of it where a possibility was not available before. Mm -hmm. And because of just thinking outside the box and saying, yes, we made this happen. And I remember talking to parents about it and they were like, how did, what's this going to look like? And the superintendent saying, I have no idea what this is going to look like, but it sounds really fun. Let's yeah. try it. And we'll, we'll make it happen. So first, First question about the book, Lead with Appreciation. So obviously 2019, why'd you write, you know, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to do some of these podcasts on these books that were written prior to pandemic and say like, how are they relevant today? So why'd you write this book in the first place? We genuinely felt, Melinda and I, and I know I can speak singularly in the same class for her. Um, there are 5,000 things expected of administrators. Um, they are supposed to encourage and motivate, but hold accountable, but you know, discipline if needed and also teach well and then make these humans great people. And there's so much pressure on teachers. Um, and principals are the bearer of that. And so it took, and I know that you remember this because I'm sure that we discussed it. It took a good seven months when I became principal before I recognized that when I walked in the room and people nodded their head and smiled and my jokes were funny and my outfits were cute, was it because of my sparkling personality? Uh, it actually was because I was the principal and your position precedes your person every single time. And my love language is gift giving. My love language is gift receiving also. Um, so and I would, <laughs> do you hear that? Michael um, I would naturally go above and beyond in certain ways to show appreciation and give, here's a cute new t-shirt staff or, Hey, I'm going to give you a ding dong and ding dong. The bells are rung. Everybody's here. Let's have some fun. Like all the puns with all the snacks until I realized that they didn't necessarily all like, Oh, thanks. The embarrassing. Like, oh, nah, nah, what? Quit sucking up. Quit trying to win us over. Quit trying to bribe us was literally their mentality until they got to know Amber, the person who has been this way her entire life. And so that was a huge turning point for me to recognize that not everybody understands the purpose or the intent when giving and receiving, and that there were other principals who think you get a paycheck. What do you want from me? <laughs> like you get compensation for the job you signed up to do. I'm not buying donuts. I'm not going out of my way to solicit fundraisers or donations to be able to fund a luncheon. Um, I don't have time for that because again, of the 5,000 things that they have to do, they just don't, they don't need it. So they don't necessarily know they should give it. So the purpose of the book was not to negate or diminish the importance of academic integrity, because again, my wolves were the brightest and smartest in all of the land. Um, we, we recognize that you have tons of meetings and you've got tons of people to make happy and you've got parents and you've got students. If we can make this one part of your job easier, if we can help you out with the ideas that maybe you're too tired or too stressed or just don't actually think of, here's an entire book dedicated to getting to know your staff why it matters, how you can do it. That was, we want to take that one little sliver of what we did, what we know that we both did and help other people with that sliver. One of the things you talked about um, when we were kind of prepping for this podcast was, the, and you kind of mentioned it, the importance of having kids have the opportunity to kind of stick out and share their own story. And you actually shared something about your, you're a twin. And yes. that's part of that. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about that experience? And, yeah, and yeah, oh, ab absolutely, absolutely. And and um, it's interesting because I, as you know, I did a TEDx talk and I wove my whole story about being a twin into personal branding because there is no doubt that it shaped my quest um, to to work on my own personal brand, but also to, to help others. This, if you think about it, like growing up as a twin has its challenges, you know, constant comparisons, Stacy, you know, like, why do you weigh more than your twin? Mm -hmm. What, you know, why does she get better grades than you? And I remember having one aunt that I don't even think that she knew our names. We were just like known as the twins. Yeah. And of course, you know, we shared a room, we had twin beds until we were 16. So I always wanted to be unique and memorable. And that's what personal branding is, is about. 
And really the biggest compliment that someone could give me growing up was like, Stacy, you are so unique. Mm -hmm. So again, I have, and I feel like it's a gift. Like I know how to package things. It doesn't matter if it's a product. It doesn't matter if it's a service or a person. I want to crystallize the, um, like their uniqueness, like what, because there's a misconception, right? Personal branding, a lot of people think it's like narcissistic. It's like me, me, me. But when it's not, it's really like, what is the value of you to others? What can you contribute to the, the college campus? And so it's finding again, what your value is and why should someone choose you? Why should you land on the top of an admission officer's pile. And the same flows through to if you're looking for an internship or trying to get a scholarship or or a job, or even to that matter, online dating, right? I've had right. some single friends like ask me yeah. for their help. Yeah. Yeah, that that that's a that that's a really important aspect of this too, because I think um, sometimes there is this like social media is fake. And, you know, you're a certain way when you're offline compared to online. And there, there is some truth to that for myself. And the way that I explain it is, for example, do I swear? Of course I swear. I swear terribly, right? Do I swear in social media? No. And the way, the way I treat it is it, it'd be like me teaching in a classroom. Like I wouldn't swear in front of students. So why would I swear in social media? And it's it's not about being fake. It's understanding the context, the context yes. of where you are, yes. um, who you're connecting with, and you don't want to lose opportunities for this too. So that's one thing that I try to explain to people. It's there, yeah. Some, of course, some people are fake. They're per, they're portraying something that they really are not. But understanding that people understanding context doesn't mean they're fake, right? Like I share a lot of my ups and downs. I don't know how much you googled me before. I know we have mutual connections, but like I have struggled with my weight for years and years and I've lost like 120 pounds over the last year. And I've shared the struggles I had with that, what I was trying, what I was doing. And a lot of people have appreciated that I shared that journey, not just when I found success, but when I was struggling with failure and they connected with me in a different way. And I would have those same conversations with my students. And that's what makes us real and relatable. And I think that's a really important aspect. And one of the things that you said, and I love this, you said, Here's like a four word quote. And I wrote it down as soon as you said, um, add value, not clutter. What do you mean by that? And I love, I, I take a, I have a perception of what that means. What's your, what, what do you mean by that when you share that? Yes. And I will answer that in a second, but I just want to tell you that I, personal branding is about being authentic and real. And I love vulnerability. I think we can show the weaker parts of, of ourselves. It, it makes us, makes us all real and we all have our own struggles. So thank you for sharing that. So add value, not clutter. That is, that is definitely my mantra. It is, there is so much clutter out there and people just turn off to it. And a lot of people will, will post, for example, on social media just to make sure that they get their one post in a day. But no, I'd rather see someone post valuable content that their audience is going to relate to. So we've all heard the term return on investment. But I like to use the term return on engagement, right? Because what you want at the end of the day is you want people to to see your content. You want to make it real. You want to make it relatable and you, and you want to strike up a conversation. That's what social media is. It's a two way exchange. And I think when, I think when people are just adding posts just to, just to feed the, you know, the content beast, it's just, it's worthless. It's, it's a waste of time because it's like, you've got to make every word count right? You've got to make every word count. And you have to like, even think about like all of your different touch points. I even tell kids, by the way, George, that like even your email signature is it's mm -hmm. priceless real estate. As you're sending it out to admission officers or alumni, put something there about yourself. Maybe, you know, put in a, a link to a video or, or maybe create a tagline for yourself. So, so again, I, I, 
it's it's like I guess also as as a news junkie because I'm in the media, but I've also been in the media. Uh, wait, I'm in the media, but I also right. am the media. I also say to people, you've got to be your own news channel. Yeah. And so I look at content with for news value from like zero to ten. Do you have like a strategy, you know, to maybe to kind of identify that something that people listening to this right now, because I, I guarantee you what you just said and what we just talked about is going to resonate with a lot of people. And some of them maybe just have a little eye opening moment. They're like, am I like exhausted? And I and I don't realize this. Like, do you have a strategy um, that you might have for people just to kind of maybe identify that something that they can do to, you know, do early intervention as opposed to sometimes too late? The uh, starting point for me is always awareness mm -hmm. so that if we think about our energy level on a continuum between tired and exhausted, or if we think of a barometer of our energy, almost like a thermostat in a house, where if we get too overheated, the air conditioner kicks on and it cools things down. We pay attention to our own internal signals and really listen to them as opposed to treating them like symptoms. Mm -hmm. And when we can do that early on, we have a chance to say, okay, you know, where is our discomfort? Is it neck tension? Is it stomach aches? Is it this feeling of dread in the morning? Is it feeling so depleted by the end of the day that we're going to bed earlier? So we always have to begin by understanding what our body is telling us and treating it as a message not a symptom to be treated. Mm -hmm. um, and because in this, listen, in this day and age, you know, it, it was exhausting being an educator before the pandemic. When you <laughs> layer in exactly. public scrutiny, the extra workload, the constant threat of health issues, going all, and all of a sudden having to do this virtual learning, it seems like it's sneaking up on a person. But I think the last two or three years has really been a catalyst of exhaustion for people because we were just functioning in crisis mode. We didn't recognize just how much was impacting us all at the same time. So for some people, the awareness is just the tip of the iceberg. The strategy is on what to do about it. That's a whole you know, right. another set of conversations, but I'll let you react to that first. Well, you know, so like I'm thinking about this because one part I'm struggling with and I, you know, it's very, um, it's very anecdotal. It's my own experience is I, I talk about like, I, I, I really try to eat healthy now. And I think the biggest solve for me when I, you know, started losing weight, getting back into better shape was not exercise. I was always exercising. It was my, my, my eating was really unhealthy and so what I do, and, I, and, and I, maybe this will make sense to you, um, is I typically eat healthy 90% of the week. And then 10% of the week, we'll have a cheat meal of the family, have some pizza, you know, ice cream. We have that. And the day after, I feel terrible. Like it's, it's so, it feels so horrible yeah. when, I, when I eat that unhealthy. Yeah. But the, the problem is, and this is, this is where I'm kind of going with this, what I struggle with is that that was so normal to me that I didn't realize it was an issue.